This is IAT 355 Visual Analytics Lecture 8.3, where we're continuing on our conversation about interaction. In this segment, we'll be talking about zooming, uh, geometric and semantic zooming, as well as cut, slice, and project as mechanisms of dealing with perhaps too much data. These build on the previous topics of having an overview of ideas about how to uh, organize um, interactive activities for visual analytics data and as well as using selection to identify pieces of data and interact with them directly. So one of the things that you often find yourself doing is perhaps while looking for a piece of data that you're interested in that you need to focus on, um, you often find yourself needing to uh, navigate and focus your attention to the general area. Um, you know, as Schneiderman's uh, mantra says, you know, overview first, filter and uh, focus, and uh, that kind of work needs to be done in a particular way. We're going to be talking about that today with the various means of controlling the view. So these fall under the domain of navigation. We tend to manage complexity by, among other things, first listed here, limiting the amount of data by perhaps some kind of uh, reduction technique or partitioning the views in space. And both of those techniques are really focused on managing uh, the geometric space of what's being depicted in a visualization. Another thing that you can do is, instead of changing the allocation of data to space by t uh, concerning yourself about the vast amount of data needing to be all projected on the screen, perhaps the thing to do is to focus the screen on a subset somehow or other, uh, and that is in the domain of time here. Moving through the data or navigating through the data is something that you always find yourself having to do if the data is large enough. Um, and another thing that often is about time is to cycle through the data views. Right now in this lecture segment, we'll be focusing on the navigation aspects of moving through the data. That is to say, control the amount of data that is present on the screen at a time. And that's why this has the red time label here. So what we're going to do is focus on moving through the data. So the first and obvious mode of moving through the data and controlling it is through panning and scrolling. So panning is the t smooth movement of the virtual camera across the scene, or it's dual, this moving the scene underneath the camera. In both of those formulations, there is this notion of a metaphorical or a computer graphical camera that is viewing the scene. And since that's kind of baked fundamentally into a formulation of 3D graphics and implicitly in 2D graphics, we're going to stick with that metaphor. But in essence, what's going on is, of course, there's no camera and lens anywhere that, that's being uh, simulated geometrically. Um, through the mechanisms of computer graphics. So panning is the notion there, takes its name from uh, moving a camera around in motion pictures. Um, scrolling is a closely related thing where instead of panning, moving the camera r virtually or really in 2D, uh, scrolling is the m motion of the virtual camera in one uh, dimension at a time. And typically, some subs in scrolling, some set subset of the view is moved horizontally, horizontally or ber uh, vertically, and it's typically bounded. It works best when the scrolling technique has a, a, a limited uh, vertical or and or his, uh, horizontal extent. So the next thing um, to talk about is zooming, um, and there are two styles of zooming. We're, of course, all familiar with the first style here, which is geometric or standard zooming. And once again, the camera metaphor is brought to bear. Um, that is, uh, zooming in means the projected size of whatever your the center of, the, of where the camera is pointed at, but that projected size gets larger, and that is uh, equivalent of zooming in. If you're interested, if you recall uh, your filmmaking classes, um, you know, it's not, we don't make a distinction between zooming or dollying, uh, the, you know, notion of a lens and the control of that or the camera position is kind of absent from this. And we just simply use, um, zooming if there's no explicit 3D representation of a camera, um, as a, a means of controlling the scaling of the object typically.
But the control of it often relies on a consistent notion of uh, the idea that you're moving a camera or it's dual, you're moving the objects around underneath the camera, uh, you know, further from the camera or closer to the camera, the face by face acting in the role of camera in this uh, visual metaphor. So geometric zooming just is pretty much directly uh, uh, an implementation of the thing that you would expect to do optically, of course, and it has a coordination with us moving physically around in the scene, uh, you know, moving closer to an object to zoom in. Semantic zooming is something a little bit difficult, uh, different. It's uh, the idea of while zooming in or getting closer to the object, instead of just seeing a scaled up and therefore more detailed version of the object, you know, uh, higher and higher resolution image of the same thing, we see a different representation depending on how much space, in some sense, is being allocated to the information visualization that the camera is pointed at. And so the representation, the visual representation that's shown depends on the meaning to be imparted to the user, to the analyst. And in the table lens thing that we uh, uh, showed on the previous um, lecture segment, the table lens essentially has semantic zooming at two levels. The you know, coarse or, or far away semantic zoom is when the entire table is presented with as each table row is a single pixel horizontal line for each of the uh, uh, variables and um, semantically zoomed in or the higher level of detail is when you click on an item it opens up and you see a textual representation for nominal data and the number is printed in addition to a horizontal line drawn depending on whatever it is that's drawn. So table lens, we'd already seen semantic zooming in, in the table lens video. Here's another example of semantic zooming, and this is semantic zooming that has taken place at uh, four uh, levels. Uh, so you read this diagram from top to bottom. At the lowest zoom level, the camera, so to speak, is farthest away, and the amount of pixels available for, um, uh, for the particular suite of data items is the minimum or the least available amongst the zoom levels. Here we see, uh, as the text says, qualitative attributes are displayed as colored horizontal bars. And we can see that each of these bars takes up the entire amount of space underneath my mouse cursor here. And the amount of vertical space is about five, you know, the pretty much 10 pixels or so, something like that. Pretty small. Not as small as uh, table lenses single pixel line, but you know, pretty small nonetheless. As more space gets to be available, and here the amount of space being alloc is allocated is expanding vertically. The horizontal uh, zoom is it is not changing. So the the horizontal magnification, as it were, is is not changing. Only the vertical magnification is changing uh, in this in this visualization. So at the second zoom level, uh, the medium low, as it were, uh, as more space gets available, the heights of the bars represent the original scale of the data. Okay, so you can see that instead of filling the boxes here, uh, we're um, uh, instead um, uh, doing a bar chart where low values and high values are drawn. In the third level of zoom, um, the raw quantitative at attributes are represented as line charts, and so we see these as lines both in this and the highest zoom level here. And the qualitative aspects that go along this, with this quantitative stuff are displayed as bars with underneath the line chart instead of uh, essentially filling kind of as rectangular boxes in a bar chart type of um, uh, depiction. The other thing that happens at the highest level of zoom where the most vertical space is allocated, there's a kind of a horizontal tick mark uh, indicating um, the value of uh, qualitative variables here. Okay, so that's an example of semantic zooming at four levels. They're all closely related to each other. So this is one of those things of it's um, uh, sometimes a little bit difficult to um, tease apart geometric zooming from semantic zooming. The thing that's confusing about it is that geometric 
zooming, expanding the amount of pixels available for the depiction. That's centrally part of both semantic and geometric zooming. But geometric zooming typically is isotropic, it's uh, sort of isometric rather, in all directions. When you're zooming in horizontally at some rate, you're also zooming in vertically at exactly the same rate. And the uh, concept is that the underlying representation of what you're looking at is not changing. There's just simply more pixels being allocated to it. And this kind of thing that you see, geometric zooming is the kind of thing you see in Google Maps, particularly when you have the satellite view turned on. So this um, thing here is another example of semantic zooming. Um, this was done by Victor Chen and Cheryl Chian at um, um, uh, Purdue University. I'm bolding, uh, calling out their names because they're both uh, CIAT. Uh, PhD graduates, gr graduates, and they have faculty positions now at Purdue, and they work with a friend of mine named David Ebert, who's at Purdue, who's been at Purdue for about uh, 20 years. Um, so, a semantic zooming in this example, this is showing uh, once again four levels of semantic zooming on a map. Uh, the only thing that's funky about this is that this is a fake map. So, this thing that we're looking at is something called uh, the vast contest, VAST being Visual Analytics Science and Technology Conference. Every year they would offer a kind of a puzzle for uh, researchers to solve, and this is an example of a puzzle that is similar to cybersecurity kind of real problems, but it's, you, you know, all the details about a real cybersecurity problem have been hidden away, and this is this kind of artificial variant of a real cybersecurity problem. And what they're doing in this thing is looking for computers and uh, that are have been hacked and you know some kind of bad thing is going on and the job of the visualization is to help the researchers the technical people to find the problem and you know get rid of it so at the coarsest level of zoom um, this is a kind of a three quarters of the image that we're looking at here um, we see a bunch of tiny little dots here each of those in, uh, corresponds to an office where computers are located and the squares are offices uh, where there's a, a lot of computers that have gone bad in some way that have ca are causing problems. When this is zoomed into, let's say uh, in this location here, uh, more space is allocated. And in fact, what they do is they add extra white space, gray space really, uh, in between the individual offices so as to allocate uh, more space for them to do more visually with the, with the individual first offices in this case, and that's what each of these things, this is an office here, and also there's a bar indicating the level of badness. So this off uh, office here has, and this office here, and this office here, have all equally level, uh, an equal level of problems going on. And the bars show percentages of problematic computers. As we zoom in further, uh, the curves show trends of problems. So instead of just essentially number of problems, this is number of problems over time. And we can see that the vertical scale is the number of problems, and this is the time scale of each of these. And this this guy, I think, corresponds to this one, this to that, and this to that, and the, some others are, are drawn elsewhere. Um, in any case, getting closer gives you more information. And that's a technique that uh, Cheryl and Victor uh, borrowed from a preceding project, which I'd mentioned very briefly, called Seesaw, um, where zooming in gives you semantically more details. Finally, at zoom level four, level four, at the bottom of the display here, what we're, uh, is going on is they're plotting uh, the problems of each individual computer, and they're just the computers are labeled by their IP numbers here, um, and what kind of uh, what kind of computer it is, and uh, presumably the level of the, the the strength of the red background is indicating yes, there's really big problems going on in this machine, and the problems seem to be uh, started first with this guy and uh, this computer, and uh, you know seem to propagate itself uh, to other computers as you might expect with some kind of virus or something like that, uh, some kind of computer virus. Okay, so that's an example of semantic zooming going from the overview where you can see where there might be problems and given that you've got some problem computers you want to focus on, you zoom in to see more and more about them and the representation changes as you get closer and closer. So um, this semantic zooming thing depends necessarily on the idea that what you need is to also have some kind of visual context. 
So providing an overview of the data set can be extremely valuable, mainly because you need to have a good idea to maintain kind of a mapping for, I'm looking at this detail about something, but what am I looking at again? What is that something? That's something that's very important to be able to do. And so providing context or overview helps you uh, understand the overall situation as well as understanding the details. And uh, providing an overview assists users with navigation and search and orients your activities. And those things are kind of useful. Um, so generally, just as in Schneiderman's mantra, you start with the overview and then zoom and filter to get closer and to, uh, you know, uh, get closer to the things you're interested in and filter as in filter out, get rid of stuff that you're not interested in. Viewers will also want to examine uh, details, individual cases and variables. And later on in the term, we'll talk about uh, ways of trying to combine overviews plus details or focus plus context, as, it called, as it's called, for the purposes of understanding where you are while understanding details. So how do we allow the user to find and focus on details on, uh, on, uh, of interest? The idea is to provide details on demand. So that's the, the overall concept. So zooming starts us. And zooming, when you're strictly following the camera metaphor, you know, you zoom close, you don't know necessarily what you're looking at. Typically, you want to be able to provide some level of context as to where am I when I'm looking at a detail. So um, here we're using one of the standard classic methods, well, these days classic methods of show me, showing zoomable details, and that is the zoomable map. Uh, I worked on a project while I was at Georgia Tech uh, that was one of the first examples of this interactive mapping concept called uh, Vegas was the name of it. And it uh, is what, um, you know, was... Uh, started in the mid 1990s and was the the first example a sample of an interactive zoomable map and the technology that uh, was developed in that project uh, went into uh, Google Google Earth and other similar mapping projects not necessarily by being uh, having technology transfer but by people reading the, the papers for the project and and implementing the same concepts in their own technology uh, for their own software so here is a uh, um, uh, Google Map this is an older one, as you can see, of, um, uh, you know, a Google Map of, um, you know, the lower mainland area. And in the bottom right is an indicator of the context of where we are. And this is sort of zoomed out by a factor of four or five compared to the main map. And as you zoom in, in this version of Google Maps, what would happen is that, you know, the blue rectangle would indicate kind of the aspect ratio and would indicate what it is that you're looking at as you were zooming in into the main, the main view. They've, of course, continued to update how this thing, how this thing works, but uh, this is the way it was a number of years ago. And so with a single view, one of the things that is common is you see the main map plus the minimap. And I think one of the things that uh, is important in this is it, the, the automatic provision of the kind of the minimap is there for the purposes of helping users start to understand what they're looking at. I think one of the reasons why that is kind of stopped being offered as a, um, in, in Google Maps is I think they measure and measure and measure how the users use it. They probably noticed that people didn't interact with the, uh, with the minimap too much, and they probably noticed also that most of the time the usage scenario for maps is for people to solve ge uh, geographic, local geographic problems in their own neighborhood. And the assumption is people aren't using the minimap because they already have pretty good knowledge of their own neighborhood or their own city. Uh, own town, own, own village, whatever it may be. So with the main, let me turn off my, uh, my camera image here for a moment, sorry. Um, in this view, it, with the main plus minimap, sometimes the overview gets the most space and the details are small. Here, the overview is small and the details are large. And you can also extend that to three levels. And that's particularly the case, uh, particularly valuable when you as the user of whatever the data uh, um, data set is, how familiar you are. Um, and so if we, you and I, are looking at molecule views, you will need the, uh, overviews all the time. Whereas if we've been working on that molecule for two or three years, we know it 
you know, intimately, so to speak. And so we don't need the overview so much. So the purpose of the overview is, is to help to remind you what it is you're looking at and where are you in the space. And as you learn more and more, these helper techniques, these helper techniques that you see here are uh, not um, so strongly needed. Um, and the other thing, obviously, is that as you pan around in one of these views, the other coordinated uh, inset views the, the, the overviews also pan around. So if you move this rectangle here, if you, you could grab this and move it around to say, uh, you know, uh, Northern Idaho, all the other, two, the other two views update. So, and you know, the issue, the design issue for this thing is how big are the different views? Where do they go? How much space do they take? And so on and so forth. And that is entirely task dependent on the suite of tasks that are uh, being observed as uh, what people are using. So with a single view, uh, another uh, a mode of zooming that we're all used to, of course, is to roll the mouse uh, the mouse wheel forward to zoom in and backward to zoom out. Um, another thing to do that you commonly see um, uh, in computer aided design tools tend to have this is you draw a rubber banded box as is shown here in a still picture. This is actually a mock-up that I put together in Photoshop, and you you zoom that area and. If you've somehow rather selected zoom in, that will be this uh, or dotted line area will be the size of the full map once it zoom, transitions to the full map. The other version is to zoom out, and um, that's essentially in indicating the ratio of zoom that you want to zoom out. So one of the, in mapping applications, one of the things that uh, makes geometric zoom work is that you have access to details when you need it. Um, and this leads to uh, a particular technique called levels of detail, uh, and that was one of the, the, the key insights to um, the Vegas project uh, that I was part of. Um, and, and that is what you needed to be able to do in order to have a you know, worldwide satellite imagery that you can zoom in and see anywhere you want. The thing that enables that is you need to have a big database of all the imagery that you want to be able to look at. Often it was the case that that database, database would take a long time to build, but once you build it, you know, you get to be able to use it. And it turns out an interesting fact is that the size of that database, it does not grow as quickly as you fear it might. It turns out that the size of the database only is 1.33 times the amount of space it takes to show the most detailed imagery because um, as we're showing with this level of de detail diagram here, we're um, zooming out. So this is um, zoomed out more, and that's the image that you would end up. We zoom in here to get this one, and we zoom in to get this one. And of course, we're focusing roughly on SFU Surrey campus. And what I'm showing here is what you would see you know, the rest of the lower mainland would be present in your view, presumably. As you zoom in, uh, the detail, because you've zoomed in, the camera is zooming equally in horizontal and vertical dimensions. All the stuff around it gets ignored or thrown out or just chucked out of cache. And um, the imagery that you're looking at gets larger and more details need to come in. And so what I'm doing is showing you the level of detail that's present in the most zoomed out view, the medium zoomed out view, and the detailed zoomed view. And as you can see, as you get closer, you see more and more detail. Um, this is, in some sense, you know, there's a transition from showing no minor streets to showing minor streets to showing minor streets that are like filled as opposed to blind segments. Um, that transition is a decision that has been made in advance to create a map. Um, and then that map is put into an image database. Um, that is, that's, this stuff is not necessarily computed on the fly for something like Google Maps. For ArcGIS, um, th this information th uh, that you see here is typically stored as geometries and rendered from the geometries, as far as I know. Um, and so it would take a little bit more time to draw uh, if this was not just, you know, going to some point in the database and grabbing that information. So uh, basically the idea with levels of detail is you bring in more detail as you need it. And typically to, uh, with, you know, geometric zoom, when you're zooming in, you're also eliminating stuff that you don't need to see anymore. So that, you know, sort of manages the overall um, uh, resource usage of, uh, of uh, the, 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 the application. So I've kind of spoken to some detail about uh, ge both geometric and semantic zooming.
Uh, Munzner also talks about uh, three other operations um, that you can do. And both of those, each of these operations are about managing the quantity of information that you have to deal with. And um, she uh, mentions two that are very closely related to each other, and they are called slice and cut. And the way they're that she illustrates them are um, in the context of you have some 3D dense information like you would have, say, with an MRI scan. Uh, of the human body. And so here's an MRI scan of the human head that has been rendered, volume rendered in a way that makes it look like, a, you know, a real object. And so what slice means is to eliminate an attribute or a dimension to focus on a small subset. So think of this three-dimensional body, three-dimensional head, and what the scanning machine has done has actually take two-dimensional sl slices in some sense. It's scanned just here to get this part and then move down, scan this part, move down, scan this part. So it's a stack of images. And a slice is essentially an image um, that has been extracted. Uh, so slice means to eliminate a dimension. So there's actually a, um, uh, a, a, a quantitative dimension here, but it's I indexed on integers and to um, you know, give me slice number 112 or something like that, and that's what this is. Closely related is cut or partition, and that is to remove half, not necessarily exactly one half, maybe one large fraction of it, to remove half the data on one side of a plane. The important concept is that there's a plane and you've made a decision, I want to keep the stuff that's on one side of the plane. And the reason why I say there are duels here is imagine that there's a, a, a cut plane here at this point on the forehead and everything above that from the perspective of the person um, is not shown and everything below that is shown and that's essentially what's meant by cut it's show me everything to the you know to one side think of it as a filter in which it what what the operation of filter is greater than or less than but everything greater than that I want to keep and everything less than that I want to chuck out or vice versa so the next operation is projection. What I'm showing here is uh, projection in the mathematical sense. The idea of projection is to mathematically reduce dimensions. And so the idea, typically I'm showing a 3D example, um, you know, and kind of representations of the 3D example. The idea is to flatten the data down to a 2D plane. And in computer graphics, particularly 3D graphics, we're doing that all the time. That's just absolutely fundamental to doing 3D graphics. The imagery is presented on a 2D screen. The imagery comes from three-dimensional geometry, so a projection operation needs to happen to go from 3D down to 2D. And what is done in computer graphics is a simulation of all the, uh, the, the uh, rays of light coming from the, uh, out there and hitting the projection screen as it, they all converge at the center of projection in the middle of each of our eyes. So for desktop 3D, we pretend that we only have one eye. And the idea of projection as a general idea is to flatten down to lesser dimensions. So in real, real life, uh, an example of a projection that we uh, are using now is the projection of my 3D face onto the 2D face of the camera. And let me turn the camera on so you can see what I'm doing because I'm busily gesturing and you're not seeing it. So here is my face and it is projected onto the camera's image plane. And also in 3D I am now holding my uh, hand uh, between the light and my forehead, and the three-dimensional shape of my hand is, uh, sorry, there we go, something a little bit interesting. The three-dimensional image of my hand is being projected onto the uh, surface of my forehead here. Thankfully, I have a nice clean forehead that I can project images on. You know, and uh, that image of the shadow projected on uh, uh, projected onto my forehead is also being picked up by the camera and projected out to you. So anyway, what's going on geometrically? Here are some examples of various kinds of perspective of projections here. And the ones that we care about in um, uh, visual analytics typically are these ones here, the orthographic projections. And typically the projections where you are selecting one or two dimensions 
to show on a two-dimensional image. I'm showing this thing here. This is, think of this as the three-dimensional shape, and what's going on is there are lines of projection from the three-dimensional location to a point on the surface for everything, all the geometry that's present. And typically, if you're doing it with line segments, you project, you know, B and L or whatever, the B and C. There's B, there's C, and then you draw a line between those two instead of projecting each of the individual points of the line if you're doing standard computer graphics. So anyway, the concept of projection is to chuck out some dimensions uh, in an organized way. It could be done mathematically where the operations are a little bit more complex, um, but in uh, InfoViz, typically you assume that there is a higher dimensional space in wh where data has been mapped, and what you're going to do is you're going to uh, take all that higher dimensional space and project it down to 2D. The simplest version of this is simply by selecting dimensions that you're going to draw. Uh, you're going to draw uh, you know, a, a 2D plot of some 3D or 4D thing. And so what I'd like to do now is show a brief Tableau demo where um, we I'm going to do a little bit of zooming, a little bit of panning, some constrained operations, and then we're going to show, you know, kind of obviously some projections. So hold on a second while I get that fired up. Okay, so here's Tableau. Uh, once again, this is the Iris data set. Um, this is, I basically picked up where I left off from a, a preceding um, a demo. And so if you recall, we had the Iris data set, and we also had identified some clusters. Uh, I'm going to take those clusters out, and now we just see the data cases here, um, and we can see here that I've also got mapped to the size, um, some, uh, you know, the, the species of the thing. And so, you know, here's an egg. And so to, you know, do zooming, um, you um, uh, can... Um, Hit the shift key and rotate your mouse, sorry, the control key, ro uh, rotate the mouse wheel to zoom in. And as you can see, as we get zooming closer, the, uh, the um, tick marks um, change around to pan. You, of course, drag, zoom out. And so here we're doing just a typical um, geometric zoom. Um, the all of the things are getting larger or smaller according to the zoom level, okay? And the geometric space is getting larger and smaller. To deal with slices, one of the things that you would typically need to do is, uh, because this is intended to be 2D, um, this is an example of adding a dimension and the way that Tableau has decided, you know, uh, has planned to deal with the addition of dimensions is instead of plotting everything together, it separates, uh, you know, sepal width on the left and petal uh, length uh, uh, on the right. I just grabbed petal length and sepal width to be on the uh, columns dimension, and I'm just going to do another, I'm going to pull that down to rows, actually, and then put uh, petal width up there. And so anyway, what we're showing here is multiple views that are coordinated to, together, and I can zoom these things. And what happens is kind of nicely, uh, when I'm zooming um, in a particular subset of the window, the, there's a coordination between the views that are, are uh, locked together because they share a dimension, both horizontally and vertically. So we see vertical zooming happening here on the, uh, on the right, upper right, and horizontal zooming on the lower right. Uh, uh, on the lower left, because I'm zooming, I'm rotating the mouse button, uh, the mouse wheel in the upper left window. Um, so anyway, what uh, with cutting and slicing and projecting, what Tableau has decided to do first off is to start not with the overview, but with nothing, um, and you add views. And what I'm doing now is I'm just taking these out and going back to the original. And here I can, once again, zoom and pan and all that kind of good stuff. So there we are. And now back to the slides. So in Tableau, the, the, the kind of the way those operations from uh, Munzner Chapter 11 have been implemented is um, 
in, in a style that is in some sense bottom up, what you want to do is you want to, the way in which you use Tableau is to bring data into the equation. Um, whereas the kind of the worldview of chapter 11 is starting from top down where you have everything and you want to reduce things. In Tableau, typically what you're doing is you're starting with no data. Well, data is in your data set and you bring data in in order to be able to examine it. Uh, generally speaking, if you start with nothing, there are perhaps other ways to start as well. So um, uh, both of those things, both of those approaches are equally valid. It really to some degree depends on what you think is most important. And one of the reasons why uh, Tableau does its bottom-up thing is typically people want to start with some kind of detailed question about some particular aspect of data. It's kind of founding worldview um, is, is about, you know, you're really focused on data. And the other thing that's important about it is when you're bringing um, data, uh, if, uh, data in from, you know, any old kind of data set, it's entirely possible that plotting everything is just completely meaningless. And, uh, you know, they made a decision essentially, you know, let's not start with everything and it being just a mess of overdrawn crap. Let's start with something clean that's easy to understand so people can build up their understanding of what's going on in the data. The overview first concept is in some sense built on the idea that you can get a coherent sense of what's going on in your data with the overview, that there's some kind of big phenomenon that you can understand, generally speaking, in the large and there are some data that are kind of not really like that in, in, in any, you know, easy to digest way. So both approaches are valuable in that regard. Okay, so in any case, that wraps it up for IET lecture, uh, 355 lecture 8.3, where we've been talking about zooming geometric and semantic as well as cut, slice, and project.